Hello, it's uh, Writing Wednesday on a cold and raining California day. Um, I have uh, huge wood uh, wind chimes on um, a, a building in my backyard that I think of as the voice of the garden, but when it's stormy, you can hear it clanging and it sounds like almost like buoy bells ahead of a storm. So uh, I can hear them wanging in there. <laughs> I was going to be flying into Prescott um, tomorrow to do a um, uh, an, uh, a reading of uh, uh, the Revolution of Marina M, and they're due to get eight to eleven inches of snow. So instead, I am going to be here and sitting and watching. Hi, thanks for joining me. Uh, <clears throat> Today I'm going to start with a letter uh, that I got from Leanne. So Leanne, if you're there, um, this is she says um, screenwriting slash story structure guru John Truby. And the screenwriter screenwriting people are really big on structure. You should know that if you've ever tried to write a screenplay, it's nothing but a scaffold for other people to uh, build uh, the complete narrative on. So structure. Hi, Leanne, I'm doing your question. <laughs> um, so I really um, want you to picture screenwriting as building this enormous solid structure that other people are going to have to climb on and build, you know, with heavy equipment and lots of money and lots of people to build their uh, movie on. So uh, especially very important in screenwriting uh, to have good structure. So screenwriting story structure guru John Truby warns that first drafts get set in concrete in the mind of the writer and the revision process can never really fix a bad first draft. Interesting. He stresses the importance of pre-planning, uh, out, even outlining a story. Most definitely in screenwriting, they do this. Prose writers are often encouraged to write an exploratory first draft and, even, and fix it in the revision process. What are my thoughts about this? How did you approach a huge project like Marina M? Okay. Um, for me, fiction is all about the exploration. Uh, for me, screenwriting, I, I tried screenwriting, you know, a horrible interlude of my life because I'm not a structural kind of person. I, I'm somebody who explores first and then I have to, um, kind of hack out the structure uh, haul it into place and, you know, put some beams in there and make sure it's going to hold up. Uh, I work very musically and that doesn't work when you have a limited, you know, you have to tell your story in 90 minutes, 120 pages, you know, there's got to be acts, you know, and uh, uh, definitely not, it wasn't my strong suit. Um, so I'm sure that that kind of writing does require um, a really strong structure. I was really impressed when I saw the structure, uh, the screenplay for um, White Oleander, which they take a huge, messy book, you know, 450 pages, and sculpted a very structurally sound um, uh, basis for a film out of it. Um, pretty impressive. Um, but this whole idea of that it sets up in your mind like cement um, is really interesting. You know, how to be able to let go of what you've written so that you can revise. And I don't usually think of, as you know, I don't have a clear delineation between the writing and the editing. I feel like it's a flow. It's an ongoing process because I, I'll write Today, tomorrow, I'll go back and revisit what I've written, polish it, change things, look at it, consider it, and then move on. So the tone will always be the same, but I'll always be rewriting. You know, be rewriting right away, being rewriting 
later writing. You know, I won't just write a huge ugly draft and never look at, go back to chapter one until I'm done with the whole thing. I mean, that, I, I won't do that. Um, although I have written in scenes that I just put in a box and reorder when I get the box full and see what fits. You lose a lot of time that way. Uh, if you are somebody who can plan your plan your dive, if you can plan your story and uh, follow your plan and hold it loosely and make discoveries and stuff, you will save a great deal of time. Uh, I wander, I have to find out, I have to open doors, I have to go into rooms that maybe don't lead into any other rooms and have to come out again and pull that out. Uh, it, it is... It is taking the long way around, and it takes more time. Uh, that's why my my um, uh, books take long to write, long time to write. Uh, so it, yes, if you can be one of those planners, you know, absolutely go for it. But this is very interesting. The idea that how do you write an exploratory first draft or an imperfect first draft, and fixing the revision process? How do you keep it from setting up permanently? Um, so that you cannot get into it to revise it. Um, it's difficult when you have fully developed something to pull it out, um, to see it as fluid. So the more you can see the editing process, I think, as part of the writing process and not a apartheid system, but it's always going to flow from one to the other. You know, you'll be rewriting what you wrote the day before or last week or something as you're creating fresh material. Then there isn't that huge division that's going to throw you, and it always is in flux. One of the wonderful books, that book Free Play by Stephen Nakmanovich, a favorite of mine, um, says that, you know, it's always improvisation. Even edit editing is improvisational. So it's never set up until you're done done it's all a work in progress so hold what you've done lightly be ready to get rid of it if it turns out that your story is taking a different turn um, I think that's a really good question um, how I approached Marina M the one thing about it being a, a um, an historical novel is that I knew the chronology I knew the chronology of the revolution I didn't know how much of it I was going to use uh, in her particular story, but I knew that I would be following a chronology, that what happened in 1919 uh, was going to come after what happened in 1917. Um, I, If I was writing a story that was more familiar to uh, my readers, um, Perhaps I could have had a more fragmented approach to the material and def and done something from 1920 in the early part and done something from 1916 in a later part. But I felt that when dealing with very unfamiliar material to my readers, the Russian Revolution to American readers or to Western readers, um, that they were going to need a little bit more of a tow rope, you know, to help them through the material. And I thought that, you know, fracturing the time frame was going to be, you know, one hurdle more than people uh, probably could could uh, incorporate into their mental map of the times. Um, so uh, I was able to at least have that chronological uh, time span. I knew I would start with these three girls and watch their relationships change in terms of the overall movement of the revolution. And indeed, those relationships changed a, a great deal. And uh, the arc finishes in the second book, uh, which is coming out in July. So the importance of pre-planning or outlining a story. If I can outline the novel, I will not want to rewrite it just for myself. I, I just am. Uh, the exploration is the reason that I am writing it. And uh, 
if I knew what it was about, if I knew how the story would turn and the structure and all that, I would write all of that pre-planning stuff, and then I wouldn't want to write the book. You know, I would just look at it and go, oh, I've done, you know, my exploration, that's all I'm really interested in. And uh, it would, I would fail <laughs> to finish that project. So you have to look at your own level of curiosity, how your creative uh, flow, what excites you, what stifles your imagination, and really um, know yourself well enough to know what's going to work for you. And you have to have failures, you know, to find out. Um, I think that uh, for me, it's having the voice. Once I have the voice of the piece, then I know what I'm looking for. Once I know the the central problem of the protagonist uh, or a, the antagonist or something, I, I get the voice of the book, then that's enough for me to start going out on that, uh, playing out that tow rope. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that people who write their personal stories and fictional, you know, they're fictionalizing, like especially a family story, not necessarily their own, but sometimes their own. They get stuck uh, when writing fiction. I mean, memoirists, you know, all bets are off. <laughs> but um, writing fiction uh, about your own, you know, using your own story as the basis or, or a family story is that you get stuck because you know what happened. And one thing links to another, links to another, links to another. Very difficult to get in there and change things that might work better. But it's terrifying because you know how the story goes. You know how you always tell it. You know how grandma always tells it. And then to get in there and, and really, this is not that interesting, you know, really how to break it open, how to change it. The more you can fictionalize a family story or a personal story, the more you can have a character who isn't grandma or isn't you. And then you can start lightening it up. Then you can start loosening it up and having other things happen. Uh, developing um, a stronger dramatic uh, line than was in the original story or more uh, nuanced characters or introducing new characters. A wonderful book that everyone should read, everyone, is uh, Joyce Carol Oates' Blonde, which is the Marilyn Monroe story, but as envisioned by Joyce Carol Oates. Um, and you'll see how fiction interacts with what happened in the mind of a very imaginative person. Um, it's beautifully done. And she, she sticks to the overall arc of the story that we know, you know, Marilyn, who's Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller and the early photographers and the mother, you know, being poisoned by her film editing work. Um, uh, so she gets the main points of that story, but what she brings to it imaginatively is really something. Um, so there's a, let's see. Yeah, it, having too much planned uh, can be a problem because you can't think of anything else. I, I, uh, I can see that, definitely. Um, the other thing I was asked this week um, was about point, another point of view question. We have uh, a friend, Barbara. I don't know if Barbara's watching you're hiding there. Uh, but Barbara said um, that, let's see, uh, to talk about uh, point of view and tense, she says that her novel in progress is a present tense, except for a flashback or two. I'm thinking of recasting the entire Dealey Bob in past tense, looking for advice um, Looking for advice if you had talked about any of this in videos. And I do have a, another POV video, but I think this is a very good question, and I think we'll, we'll um, uh, address it. 
so I don't know if Barbara's listening. Um, but uh, the present tense is really problematic. It's the I am doing this, I am doing this, she is doing this. Uh, we use it because we think that we're going to get a big sense of immediacy. You know, you are there. Oh, somebody coming in the door. Oh, ah, you know, it's like ch -ch -ch -ch, everything's happening at once. Very exciting, right? But you should know that the most common point of uh, that present point of view is when a child tells you a story. And then we go to this, we see the lions and the tigers, and then grandma had a heart, has a heart attack, and we go to the hospital, and we have ice cream, and then we're petting the dog, and, you know, it's all the same. Uh, first person present is very, what I call, face in carpet. You are like nose down in the carpet, and you only see what's coming right up to your eyes. Your character has no time to think about things, to step back, to have a bigger view of life, you know, which is what we read for. You know, it's when we, when a character can get their face out of the carpet and step back and make a state, big statement about the world, about human life. I mean, that's what I'm always looking for when I read fiction, is when the character stops reacting immediately to everything that's going on around them and takes a step back and says, you know, gives us a, an idea of where this fits into the human experience, you know. Um... When the character never has a thought except immediate, immediate reaction to what is going on in the story, it never rises to the level of art. It, it doesn't. You know, we read for those moments where we learn something about hu the human experience. That's why the great writers, you know, that's why we read and reread and reread the great writers. Because they take time to show what the individual, how the individual experience sits in with the larger human problem, what it is to be a human being on earth, uh, tells us more about and more, or thinks more deeply about the human experience. So I am not a big fan of present tense. Um, I will. You know, if it's really well written, I'll push my prejudice aside and really enjoy the book. Uh, but it, it's a child's voice. It is, and then, 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 and it's like, you know, I've talked to a kid before. I mean, I've had those stories. Um, and I want to get out of the carpet a little bit. I want to have a more, uh, a bigger view of, of, the world. And even by putting that sucker into past tense, people feel, especially if they're having a, a story that's taking place a present day, and then part of the story, even half of the story, taking place in the past, um, the distant past, you know, years ago. They feel they have to use the present tense for the present story to differentiate from uh, the past story. Say, you know, 1918, uh, 2018 and 1960. They, they, so they'll do the past, the, the 60 in past tense, and then they feel, oh, well, I've got to have the present story in present tense so that people can tell the difference, people can tell the difference. But you can get so much more out of past tense because the character has clearly, the, the narrative voice clearly has had some time to consider what, what has happened. Um, so, for instance, in Marina, there is a, you know, young woman who's telling her story. But... 
we get a more mature voice because it is in past tense. We went to the Varvara's and this is what I saw in Varvara's house and this is what her crazy mother was like and, and she's giving me a tour. She gave me a tour of her um, small apartment as if it were, you know, the grand tour of Italy. Um, there, There is no reason for that present tense unless you really have good control of your subject. Your present tense character has incredible powers of observation and interior life that they're thinking all the time. But I find it, it gets really, I find it dull and it overlooks a great deal of things. Uh, It's a good practice to try things in present and past. Uh, when you're re- rewriting or something, put it in the other tense just to, s- you get you get information, uh, you get vital sense information maybe when you go into present tense, just even as an experiment. Um, when, you know, re- editing, rewriting, whatever you want to call it, um, just to try it and you get information, then you can switch back, but you keep the information you got. Um, What about a present tense narrator who uses past? That's what I'm talking about. Uh, I generally would rather have you do past tense. Uh, It's a mark of an amateur and it's kind of childlike voice. Um, But for everything I say, you know, there's always the person who does it incredibly well and beautifully and you wouldn't want them to change it. So I'm talking about rules of thumb and not ironclad, you know, laws. Um, I do, and then whether first person, third person, you know, a, probably a most mature way of writing is a third person past tense where the author can really get back and give us a view of, of, um, uh, of that character, which a character in first person can't look at themselves very well. Um, they can't make statements about themselves. And an interesting thing to do is when you're, um, uh, when you're working on yourself as an artist, when you're doing exercises and and prompts and stuff, which I, I think everyone should do, no matter how accomplished, you know, you get stale and it's good to do exercises just like, you know, a concert pianist is still going to do scales (laughs) and a lot of them and a concert writer you know, like yourself, should be doing exercises just to keep, you know, keep limber, you know, keep the trills uh, working. So there's something that I want to show you that is very interesting to do, which is taking a, uh, you know, taking a work and then rewriting it in another tense or another, um, another tense or another person. And here's, here's one that I just, I love. This is a book, and I'm going to turn the camera around so uh, we're not going to see things in a mirror view. Uh, This is a book called um, Wintering by Kate Kate Moses uh, about Sylvia. It's a novel about Sylvia Plath, which I love. And when I teach this, I use this. So I'm going to switch this around. Okay, so this is, what I do is I'll take a paragraph and I'll move it into a different, here I'm going to move this out of third person into first person, just so you can see what that would look like. So the third paragraph here. Okay, let's see if I can do this so you can read it. There we go. I've got it, she calls as she reaches the phone table. What is it? Rounding her voice, calm, efficient. As her hand extends towards the black receiver, she sees Ted turn the corner at the top of the carpeted stairs and hesitate. So this is present tense, huh? Hesitate in the shadows. She raises her chin to him and sends a tight, hopeful little smile, a tight, intimate motion 
between tiny intimate motion between people long married, almost a reflex, almost benign. She picks up the telephone, cutting off its shrill pulse. She brings the receiver to her ear. Hello? All right, so what I want to do is is read this again in in first person. And let's see how that stands up. I've got it, she called as she reached the phone table, rounding her voice, calm, efficient. As her hand extended towards the black receiver, she saw Ted. See, it's not, a, not that much different. But let's take it out of third and put it in first. I've got it. I call as I reach the phone table, rounding my voice, calm, efficient. See, you wouldn't say that in first person. You don't see yourself that clearly. You're not, uh, unless you're some kind of, you know, um, talented Mr. Ripley, you don't view yourself that distantly. So you don't notice that you're reaching for the phone, these small gestures. You don't notice your own gestures. You know somebody else's gestures. Um, you know, how you round your own voice. You're not going to notice that unless it's super creepy and deliberate. As my hand extends towards the black receiver, as my hand extends towards, I mean, that's like, Really bad writing. I would never, I wouldn't want to see that uh, in first person. I see Ted turn the corner at the top of the carpeted stairs and hesitate in the blue shadows. I raise my chin to him and send him a tight, hopeful little smile. Like, how in the world would I see my own tight little smile? You don't. So in, in playing with your own... Um, sense of what the tenses do and what the um, person does. To take a book that you really like and take a paragraph and change the tense and see how it works. Change the, change the person and see how it works. I, you can get a lot more information about what the protagonist is doing in third person. You can get a lot more big thoughts. Then when you switch to first, you can use, back to first, you can use a lot of that stuff. Some will fit, some will never fit. But you get that information. Um, so I'm not big on, um, not big on present tense. It's very childlike to me. And then, and then, and then, and then. Uh, you don't get to step back and think about how married people send messages. You know, you're just sit, sitting there with your face in the carpet. Um, so what else can I tell you about this? P point of view is a tool, present, past, first, third. Uh, and it's like, what do you want to do with it? The That first person is very, the more uh, your piece is a voice piece, the more important it is to be first person. Uh, when you, if you see a very voicey um, work like Sapphire's Push, um, putting that in third person would be a crime because you would lose that voice. It doesn't make any, any, any sense in uh, in third person. You don't believe it. It's just. You're, you're losing the fact that it's this amazing, uneducated girl trying to tell her own story. That's the whole point of it. The language is the whole point of it. And those books are almost always first person, where the, you know, the language is the person. It tells you everything about them. Um, so what else can I ask you? Uh, what... A, any questions? I'm happy to take your questions today, um, but I really urge that. I, I, when I teach this, I teach, um, I use wintering, I use the Poisonwood Bible, which has um, six points of view characters, all, I believe, in the first person. Um, I use Samantha Dunn's um, 
failing Paris, which she uses second person. And second person is interesting. That's um, when your shrink tells you, say, don't say you, say I, because it's a way of deflecting um, your thoughts. When it's done in, in, um, in fiction, you know, it's odd. It catches the reader's attention. It's like a bum coming up and grabbing your, your, by the, you know, you buy the jacket and yeah, you know, you gotta understand it's like this. And it's like, wow, you know, yeah, you got my attention. So it's purposefully odd. Um, all the great, uh, first person voices in the po Poisonwood Bible. That is amazing. Um, what else do I use uh, when I'm teaching this? So, you know, t look at how people use tense, uh, use person. Um, there's, I use, um, let's see, Bank of America, uh, one of the short stories. Uh, one of the short stories in um, uh, Dead Boy, I think it's called Dead Boys by Richard Lang. Um, uh, what a great short story collection, really good, um, strong point of view. Um, I use, you know, third, uh, it's Anna Karenina, you know, the omniscient, uh, voice. I use limited omniscient is, uh, or limited third is, uh, Hills Like White Elephants, the, um, where you don't know anything about what's going on inside people. Um, a stream of consciousness is that close, close. I mean, that is you're inside somebody's head, and you're seeing the uh, you're seeing things whipping by. Um, you can't difficult to tell a whole story that way, you know. Not even Joyce did, <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting, um, but it better be. Uh, you know, you, you need a reason for it. It has to work for you. Uh, of course you'd use present tense. You know, that's... Uh, so, you know, the classic would be, um, you know, in Ulysses, Leopold Bloom's sections in that are, are fantastic, and Molly Bloom, uh, very worth studying. So I, I suggest you take your books and just make yourself a lesson plan, you know, Let's examine first person in these books. Take a paragraph, put it in third, put it in past, put it in present, see how, see how it plays. And, uh, you know, look at various works and how, how it works. Um, the second was used in pre-naturalistic novels, you know, before they knew how to write novel and that continuous dream that Henry James talks about in the 18th century, they always address the reader directly you know, in Stern and those guys. Um, so it definitely, you know, dear reader, you know, <laughs> you're, you're on the hook. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So, uh, any other question? How about integrating backstory from main story? Uh, yeah, I'm all for it. <laughs> uh, you know, in psychological time in your head, you, there is no time. So you can be in the, you can be, um, in, in the chronological present of your story doing something. And then something makes you think of your boyfriend in high school and you can give us, uh, whatever it is that's pertinent to that scene. There's a reason why you're thinking of that person. There's some kind of illustrative purpose for thinking of your old boyfriend, um, and then you're right back in the present of your story. And they can both be in past tense. You don't have to, to do the present story in the present tense. All right. Well, uh, there are no more questions. I wish you good reading. And you can always send me uh, throughout the week. You can send me your questions. And I'm happy to answer them. All right. Wishing you a good one. Bye.